a nation, the British have a love affair with Spain. 12 million people a year come to worship its sun-kissed shores. In this series, I want to find out what fascinates us about this country and if there is more to Spain than meets the eye. I'm amazed. I had absolutely no idea that this was here. This will be a journey of discovery for me. I did not expect this. Wow. As I crisscross the country, longing to know more about it. Seeing its world famous landmarks up close. Awesome. Awesome. This is one of the places that everyone should see before they die. And uncovering lesser known sites. You do literally feel transported. as I experience this incredibly vibrant culture. Woo! 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 It's pretty mad, isn't it? I think it's just one of those moments I'm never going to forget the whole of my life. <laughs> There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. My Spanish adventure begins in the north of this magnificent country, a journey that will take me from the Rioja region, through the Basque country to the city of Pamplona, finally arriving in Catalonia and the enchanting city of Barcelona. On my way, I'll experience the infamous running of the bulls. That is one of the more insane things I've ever seen in my life and I'll become immersed in the drama of a truly inspiring Catalonian tradition. It's a mad thing that actually means something. It's very, very moving. My starting point is a region celebrated the world over for its vineyards, Rioja. This wine lover's paradise is only two hours south of the ports of Santander and Bilbao. Home to some of the finest vineyards in Europe, where every year 175 million bottles of wine are produced. Nestled in amongst the emerald vines, I'm visiting one of the oldest, most highly regarded wineries in the region, Marques de Riscal. Founded in 1858, the wines produced here are exported to over 100 countries. This is the first expansion of the company of the year 1883. Carlos takes visitors on a tour of the winery. So, well, this is the wine aging room for these uh, three top wines. Mm -hmm. Everything here in, uh, in French oak. It smells delicious in it here. Is. I want a perfume. I want to smell like this. Mm. It smells <laughs> really delicious. These historic cellars hold more than 37,000 barrels of wine. The subterranean vaults are where the vintage wines are stored and where I'm being given rare access to what they call a cathedral of wine. So we are in the original uh, winery. This is the, uh, the cathedral. What we call it here, the cathedral is the treasure of the winery. And uh, inside here we have uh, wine since the very beginning since uh, 1862 it was the first uh, wine put in bottle oh my gosh can i go in there yeah we are going to get inside wow this is my kind of cathedral it is incredible it is very evocative. I mean, centuries of dust have never seemed so attractive, I'm telling you. Magnums. Amazingly, Riscal has preserved bottles from every year since the vineyard's inception. Some of them have been resting here for over 150 years. So this one I know is uh, 1870, because this one uh, 
Is it still drinkable, this wine? Yes, it is. It's because of the first, because of the conditions of uh, we have in this uh, room. We are talking yeah. about the humidity between 80-85%. It's always the light off. Today we can say that between 75-80% uh, uh, of this wine is still drinkable. <gasps> And mm. I hate to bring it down to the base. What would a bottle of 1870 sell for? So it's, uh, the question is, in reality, we don't sell these bottles. We open them in very special occasions. It's priceless. It's incredible that they have this repository of wine, which they never sell. They open on special occasions that very few people see. And I'm here seeing it. The wine might be priceless, but not everything here is quite as exclusive. There is plenty for tourists to see. And as part of the experience, they can stay at this hotel. Built on top of the wine vaults, this is one of the most striking pieces of architecture in the country. Isn't that beautiful? It's rather amazing here in this really verdant countryside to find this modernist masterpiece. It's very exciting to come across it. Incredibly, the owners managed to persuade the legendary Canadian architect Frank Geary to design this bold hotel. Its dramatic ribbons of pink gold and silver titanium have echoes of one of his most famous buildings, the Guggenheim in nearby Bilbao. When he was first asked to take on this commission, he refused because he'd only just recently done Bilbao. And cleverly, the owners enticed him with a couple of bottles of wine from his birth year vintage. And he was persuaded, and this is the result. Quite something. But a stay here isn't all about drinking the vineyard's wine. I'm visiting the spa to experience what they call venotherapy. By incorporating wine into a beauty treatment, every bit of the grape gets used here. This is called a crushed Cabernet scrub, a mixture of grape seeds, dark honey, and essential oils. My skin will be soft as a baby's bottom after this, and I'll be lubricated by wine from both the outside and the inside. So relaxing. <laughs> And just as well, because tomorrow I've got a very early start. I'm in the north of Spain in the Rioja region, famed for its vineyards. At the heart of it is the charming city of Logroño a place that, in recent years, has built up quite a reputation for its food. You'll find several Michelin-starred restaurants here, but the quality of food is remarkable even down at street level. Those in the know can get some incredible cuisine in Logroño for a fraction of the price. On one street in the heart of the old town, you can find a plethora of pint-sized culinary delights called pinchos. Quanto bar hoy? Hoy aquí hay 73 establecimientos. 73 bars here today. I'm looking forward to this. Yum yum. <laughs> My guide Ricardo runs the association that the 73 traders belong to. Each one of them serve a different pinchos, which is a take on the more widely known tapas, but usually served on a skewer. Typically washed down with a glass of local wine, a wonder down this street is a bar crawl with a difference. What's this? Esto es lo que se conoce como la senda de los elefantes. Yes. Porque la gente cuando entra sí. eh, sale trompa. Entonces, trompa quiere decir. In en, en español, ir, ir, ir borracho, ir... <laughs> Barcolando. So as they walk from bar to bar with a drink every time, they kind of stagger here and there, and that's the pathway of the elephants. This is 
uno de los bares que ponen pinchos más sofisticados, más de cocina moderna. Oh, very sí. nice. Oh my gosh, love. Look at oh. How beautiful they are. Vamos a ver, vais a comer patatas a la crujiente, que es especialidad de la casa, okay. con una salsita un poquito picante y una explosión de huevo que es envuelta en panceta ibérica finita y lo de fuera hacemos una lámina de patata y la deshidratamos, entonces podemos moldearla. Sounds mad. Of course, a glass of Rioja is the essential ingredient in the Logroño experience. Thank you. Thank you. See, it's sad. Doesn't take much to twist my arm. This is my idea of pepper. Entero? Entero. Entero and un poco caliente. That really is an explosion of egg. Indescribable. Pete's having a sandwich on the motorway, let me tell you. <laughs> it will cost you less than a service station sandwich, too. Most of these pinchos are only a euro or two. Se inyecta la salsa y se come con piel y todo. It's lucky I'm not on a diet because I cannot imagine that this is terribly good for the figure. I'll walk it off on the way to my next treat. Vamos a tomar una brocheta de langostino con piña natural. Cuida que quema igual. No, está bien. Sorry, but you know, I've got children. I'm used to doing it. Oh my god! I mean, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm on my third glass of wine. This is telling you, actually, a very good day. Suddenly, the elephant's path is making sense. Gente va va trompa y va de bar en bar. Va trompa. I like that. Va trompa de ahí viene. Our final stop is a Logroño legend. Well, that means basically the dog's bollocks because these are the best of the best. Este es el cojonudo. This is a typical Riojan pinchos with a trio of local ingredients, fried egg, chorizo and alegría, which is a spicy chili pepper. Y entero. Oh my god. Si puedes. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. You first. Oh, está difícil. <laughs> Venga. Cojonudo. Cojonudo. That really is dog's bollocks. Cojonudo. Salud. Salud. I mean, life really doesn't get much better than this. An hour northeast of Logroño is the Basque region, an area with a distinct cultural identity. Within it lies the city of Pamplona, home to one of the most controversial and crazy festivals on earth. Each July, a million pleasure seekers descend on this city for the raucous festival of San Fermín. They come for a week of music and merrymaking, but most of all for the infamous running of the bulls. It's pretty mad, isn't it? It's a deeply rooted celebration that's been held every July since the 16th century. It originated from the need to move the bulls through the city to the bullfighting ring. Today, it draws people from across the globe. There's a real party atmosphere. You can feel everyone's a bit nervous and quite excited. Um, <laughs> and possibly slightly drunk. All these fearless, or some may say foolish, daredevils are here to place themselves in the path of six furious bulls. 
you nervous? A little bit. Why not just live your life? If I'm gonna go, I'd rather do it, go doing something wild than you know, be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay. Yeah. All right, good luck. Thank you. I run away the ball. Let's go. Boy, hey. Are you, you going to run yourself? No way. Why not? No, no way. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? It's amazing to be amongst it all. I'm really glad I'm not running. I first became aware of the bull run when I read Ernest Hemingway's 1926 classic, The Sun Also Rises. The description of the festival was so vivid that it's been on my bucket list ever since. I can't believe I'm here after all these years, almost 45 years old, and I'm getting to see this. I'm so happy, really excited. Just a pretty bonkers idea, the whole thing. I mean, look how tight their mass down there. You know, it's quite hard to run in that kind of pack, especially when being chased by six bulls. <laughs> quite a few of them are carrying rolled up newspapers, and I wonder if that's to bang a bull on the nose when it gets too close. A wave of nervous energy is surging through this narrow street. I have to say, the atmosphere from when I first arrived has changed dramatically. Everyone was quite drunk and quite merry, and everyone started to get their game faces on. Everyone looks a lot more serious. It's no wonder there are nerves. Up to 300 people are injured every year, gored or trampled under the hooves of the thundering herd or their fellow runners. 15 people have died over the last, I don't know how many years. So there, and lots of people get quite seriously injured. It's over in the blink of an eye. The run usually lasts only three or four minutes. I honestly, I've got goosebumps. I mean, that was so fast. God knows what has happened that end, but this end, someone fell over and over at the top, but someone's down there. It's not just the runners that get hurt. In all the excitement, it's easy to forget that for the bulls, this is a brutal tradition that ultimately ends in death tonight in the bull ring. But this is one of those events I simply had to see once. Really, really glad that I finally fulfilled my childhood wish and I've seen the running of the bulls happen. I mean, that is one of the more insane things I've ever seen in my life. They always say, you never feel so alive as when you're almost dead. I'm about to test that theory and face my fear of heights in Barcelona. I don't know quite what to say. I'm rather blown away, to tell you the truth.
I've travelled east of the Basque Country and the madness of the Bull Run to the region of Catalonia. Like the Basque Country, Catalonia is steeped in history and tradition, and its people are fiercely proud and protective of their cultural identity. I've arrived at the jewel in its crown, its capital, one of the world's greatest cities. I love Barcelona and I have ever since I visited it for the first time about 15 years ago. Barcelona is a completely enchanting city with boundless culture, fabled architecture and sun-drenched beaches. I feel like this is a very vibrant and creative city. It's a city that allows you to be anything you want to be. It's long been a city synonymous with art and has inspired artistic luminaries such as Salvador Dali, Pablo Picasso and Juan Miró. But it's an architect who truly exemplified the Catalan quest for independence and innovation. His name was Antoine Gaudí. Gaudí's ingenious and whimsical creations are perhaps the most visible and famous art in Barcelona. What I love about it is his refusal to tread a well-trodden path. He went off piste, let's face it. There's no greater example of his eccentric creativity than his masterpiece, one of the most famous and recognizable cathedrals in the world, the Sagrada Familia. This wonder has been in construction since 1892. It was Gaudí's passion project, the ultimate expression of his wild imagination. Every time I come here, I'm just overwhelmed by how over the top it is. It is so detailed and extravagant and bonkers. You don't know where to look first. They are so many things that I love about this building. When Gaudí died in 1926, only a quarter of the project was complete. By the time it's finished, it will have taken longer than the Egyptian pyramids to build. It's expected to be completed in 2026, at which point it will have been in construction for 150 years. That is, if it is completed in 2026, which many people doubt. Looking around, I can understand why. The interior is even more jaw-dropping. Feels like a monument to man's ingenuity. It's an astonishingly ambitious building which unsurprisingly attracts four million visitors a year, making it the most visited monument in Spain. When Sagrada Familia is completed, it will be the tallest religious building in Europe. As this artist's impression illustrates, the central tower will stretch a hair-raising 172 meters into the sky. And today, I'm honored to have been given real access to the construction of that tower but it means confronting a real fear. I am, to say the least, not madly keen on heights, but this is the opportunity of a lifetime and there's no way I'm missing out. So, let's have to get on with it. Architect Esteve is escorting me on my ascent. I'm Alex. Hi, I'm Esteve. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. How are you? Good, looking yeah. forward to this. OK, let's go. Let's go, thanks. Sure. Esteve is one of a team of 50 architects who, alongside 100 builders, are working tirelessly to try to complete the project before 2026. Much of the work happens at incredibly vertiginous heights. So now, now we are going to go up to 30 metres. Just being able to see this so close. It's amazing. How high does this 
this take us? Well, we're gonna go from 30 till 54 meters high. 54 meters high. I can only imagine the weight on this architect's shoulders to realize Gaudi's extraordinary vision. But what is more terrifying to me right now is that I've still got to go up. This is not comfortable for me. This, look at this. And this. Oh my God. Yeah, don't look down. I'm not looking, don't worry. Oh my goodness. They're almost there. Oh my God, it's mad. <clears throat> Maybe made me feel very hot and sweaty walking along that platform. I'm fine as long as I don't have to look over the edge. It's, it's mad to see the detail up so close and personal. I don't know quite what to say. I'm rather blown away, to tell you the truth. I'm not often lost for words. Perhaps my fear of heights has rendered me speechless. And there's another lift to go. This is really exciting. Yay! Wow, now I'm glad I came up here. This is amazing! Well, as you can see, we are in the highest point now on the works. We are around 85 meters high from the ground. This is as high as I've been in a long time, <laughs> and this is as high as I plan to get. You can see that this will be the beginning of Jesus Tower, and also when this will be completed, we will have the cross and the whole building, which is really in the centre of the city. Gaudi believed that nothing man-made should ever be higher than God's work. It's no coincidence, then, that the ultimate height of his monumental creation will be one metre short of Barcelona's highest mountain, Montjuic. Coming up here was definitely worth the fear. I mean, we've got this amazing view. I've got to see some work that very few people get to see really up close. I wouldn't have missed this for the world. The cathedral may be the most recognisable piece of art in the city, but in the Gothic quarter just off Las Ramlas, a shop that counts Salvador Dali and Pablo Picasso as former customers is also well worth a visit. At the legendary El Ingenio, they sell giant papier-mâché heads. It's surrealism in the flesh. Beyond the myriad of masks and puppets lies a family-run business spanning generations. Today, it's run by Catalan Rosa Cardona. This is amazing. What is this shop? I've never seen anything like it. Pues esta tienda es una tienda de, arte, de artesanía de cartón piedra, sí. pero para más que nada para fiestas populares, fiestas populares de Cataluña. These giant heads are used in festivals that happen all over the region. So, how long has this shop been uh, here in Barcelona? De 1838. No! Yo no estaba. Eh? Oh, totally. <laughs> Tenemos cabezudos de, 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 de gente popular, mm. pero también cabezudos grotescos. Where do you make these things? Ah, oh, en el obrador. Okay. <laughs> Hidden behind a curtain at the back of the shop is a dark cave-like workshop where master craftsman Augustine methodically moulds these weird and wonderful heads out of layers of papier-mâché. 
Hola, Agustín. Hola, buenas tardes. How long has Augustin been here? Sí. ¿Cuánto tiempo ha uh, trabajado? Uh, 46, ¿no? no. Sí, 46. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, this man who's been working here for 46 years, it's like, I mean, in the cave, creating these mad products, it's an astonishing story. These heads that Augustine has devoted his life to take months to make. The largest ones, the giants, can cost up to 3,000 euros. ¿Quieres que te enseñe un cabello? Aquí tengo uno. Sí, por favor. Oh my gosh. I'm pretty sure that would make me feel very claustrophobic. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's really very odd, that is. <laughs> can you see me there? Where does she see from? From the mouth? I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> I'm, trying. Oh. I'm not sure this is supposed to be happening. Momento que esto no me acordaba que costaba. Now I'm starting to get worried. He tenido un problema. I've never had to rescue someone from an oversized head before. Thank God my resourceful producer has come to the rescue. Pero este modelo no. Honestly. Oh, pobre señora. No pasa nada. Okay? Me conformo con una careta. <laughs> sí, una careta, sí. <laughs> eh. That was a surreal moment in a city that's no stranger to surrealism. Perhaps because Barcelona has a long history with a powerful spirit absent. Bar Marsella is reputedly the oldest absinthe bar in town. Located in El Raval, it was a favorite haunt of everyone from Picasso to Hemingway, drawn in by the ambiance and the absinthe. Good evening, Jose. It's been in Jose Marsella's family for generations. Thank you. This place looks like it's exactly the same as it was three generations ago. It exactly looks the same. So I've been looking at some of the bottles on the shelves. And... They are real. They are full. Oh my gosh. And some ones are from 1818, 1820s, 1850s, depends of the year. This is because we forgot where are the keys and we never opened them. <laughs> so. so it's very practical. It's just there because it's there. Marseille is timeless. 200 years of history hanging in the air. It's in the peeling paint, the dust ridden shelves, the blackened mirrors, and the chandeliers choked by cobwebs. I love the fact that you don't play music in this bar, that when you come here, people can hear each other. And... But it's, it's very unusual these days. Yeah, this is the most important thing of a bar. Yeah. The bar is a connection with the people. This is a bar for night owls. It doesn't open until 10 o'clock at night, but people flock here nonetheless, drinking in the sense of history and the absinthe. I fear I'm not going to like it, but I'd still like to try an absinthe. Perfect. Thank I will you. give you one. Thank you. For to prepare the absinthe, the sugar goes At to the, the end of the 19th century, absinthe was embraced by the bohemian crowd who gathered in cafes and bars like this one in search of inspiration. Although it was banned at the turn of the century, absinthe is now perfectly legal in every country in which alcohol is legal. The thing is that inside of the absinthe is the green fairy. Yes. And the green fairy is sleeping. And so you have to, to wake her up. For to waking up, you have to give them something sweet. Salute. Salute. It's a tough job, but somebody has got to do it. It's hard. 
is going to polish me off. I'll be dancing on the tables now. I start dancing on the table because it's not me, it's the Green Fairy. I've travelled to Barcelona in Catalonia, a region with a strong identity. In Catalan culture, nothing symbolises this more than the unique phenomenon of human towers. Wandering through Barcelona, it's a fairly common sight, even though it may look and sound like a medieval fair. Young or old, big or small, everyone is welcome in the human pyramid. Slowly and methodically, the castle builds up. It requires technical ability and daring, but these human towers are not just an exercise in thrill-seeking. Dating back to the 18th century, human towers represent the foundations of Catalan culture. I'm on my way to meet Eduard Perez, one of the organizers of the Castellers de Barcelona. Where does the tradition of human towers come from? It's a 200 years old tradition, especially from Catalonia. It comes from a religion tradition. They try to simulate the cross of Jesus Christ, but with the pass of the time, we have avoided the religion sense. And today, it's just a tradition a Catalan tradition uh, that resumes what are Catalan people. Does it have a social value, do you think? What do you get from it? It's uh, the collaboration, the solidarity, the team working. There is a motto to say uh, what human towers are. Forza, equilibri, valor y sein. That means uh, a strong, balance, courage and common sense. The four words are very important as a, for the Catalan tradition of Castellers. I'm going to join a Castel training session to learn more about this Catalan tradition. These local people gather for three hours, three times a week, to practice and perfect. I'm just amazed by how many people turn up on a Tuesday night just to do this. It's kind of a, an odd pastime, seems to me. It's a combination of balance, strength, and clenched teeth concentration, with a healthy dose of bravery and trust. It's way more intense than I had anticipated. There are three definite parts to a castle, the piña or base, the trunk, and the pom de dalt, the crown of the castle two structures, the four structure here, and three structure here, yeah. to make the seven structure. Always a child that gets from this part and the other for the other part. The very last person to ascend is the Anxaneta. Agile and light-footed, this nimble nipper clambers up the tower and raises an arm in the air when he or she reaches the pinnacle. As a mother of two small children, my heart is in my mouth, and I feel strangely emotional. My children are the very courageous people. It's the most incredible thing. You need the, the combination of all the people, all the human team working together. It's, it's an incredibly moving. Experience. I don't know how else to say. Well, do you want to join us? Come with me. Eduard has invited me to become part of the piña, the base of the tower. As they put the people, I will put you to push with your arm and your hands. You have to take the arms like this. You will take her. Or here, or here. Approach to the tower. Wait a minute, wait, wait. Wait, now. Take the arms here. Touch with the chest. 
and the head down, okay? because you are in contact. It's uh, the Catalan culture. You are touching everybody uh, and you need to contact, to be, to be in contact with all the people. And uh, that's the, the reason of what we can do, human towers. That was the most astonishing, affecting and humbling experience. I'm really fighting not to cry, and that is not me. It really isn't me. I mean, I don't know what, what it is that's making me feel so emotional exactly. But I think it is just unusual, this level of trust and this level of commitment and this, this mad thing that actually means something, though. It's very, very moving. And when I was part of it, you just do feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. Watching this, you get a sense of the pride these people feel about preserving their culture and passing it through the generations. I think it's just one of those moments I'm never going to forget the whole of my life, the day that I came and saw this happening here. This experience perfectly encapsulates everything I've seen on this first leg of my journey. Next time, I'll be exploring the East Coast. I don't think I've ever been anywhere like this. From the little known highlights of Valencia. I had absolutely no idea that this was here. To the expat enclave, the Costa Blanca.